Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 4 of the Power of Books podcast. My name is Timo Jübner, I'm the founder of Timo's Notes and every week I will interview popular non-fiction authors about their best-selling books. The goal of the show is to introduce you to new books, provide you with helpful advice and practical tools and give you a glimpse behind the scenes of the book and beyond its contents. My guest today is Alan Stein Jr., Alan is a corporate performance coach and world-renowned speaker. For more than 15 years, he was a performance coach for some of the greatest basketball players in the world, including guys like Kevin Durant, Kobe Bryant and Steph Curry. Now he shares his experience with a much broader audience as the author of the books Raise Your Game and Sustain Your Game. In today's episode, we'll be talking about his latest book, Sustain Your Game. We'll cover topics like how to handle the pressure of the moment, the power of visualization, how to create change, and a lot more. So now, let's get right into our conversation. Enjoy the show. Alan Stein Jr., welcome to the Power of Books podcast. I'm really happy to have you on today, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Oh, I am as well. It's so great to be with you. This will be fun. Thanks so much. So before we start talking about your book, I actually have two other questions. So first of all, I recently saw on your Instagram profile a couple of days ago, ago that you took part in a Navy SEAL exper experience. And I was curious, can you maybe tell us a little bit what that was about, what you did, um, and maybe how you implemented or applied the things that you teach, or maybe what you've learned from this experience. I'm really curious to hear what this was all about. I'd be happy to. Well, part of my life philosophy is I always like having something on my calendar to look forward to and more specifically, uh, something on my calendar to be training for. Uh, I'm 46 years old, but I, I really prioritize my physical health and well-being and I'm very active and work out very consistently. Um, but I'm no longer a competitive athlete. I, I don't play on a team or, or anything like that. So every two to three months, I like to have something to train for. And uh, in the past, I've, I've done hikes where I've gone rim to rim in the Grand Canyon. Uh, I've done a Spartan race. Uh, I've done some ultra marathons. Um, I've done a variety of different things. And, and uh, about six months ago, I signed up for this Navy SEAL training experience. And ultimately, um, I, I went out to Geneva, Ohio, and there were two uh, very decorated Navy SEALs uh, led by Commander Mark McGinnis. And they led a 26-hour straight uh, Navy SEAL simulation to kind of uh, simulate, and I use that word very loosely, um, kind of the experience they go through during BUDS training and, and through their Hell Week. And there were 15 of us that were participants, and the ages ranged from, from 22 to 60. Uh, there were two females in the group, um, people from all over the United States and all different parts of corporate America, and we came together to, to, to really learn, you know, some of the key principles of leadership uh, in teamwork and cohesion through the lens of a, a former Navy SEAL. And I really enjoyed the experience. Um, I trained pretty hard for it. So I was very, very well prepared and uh, yeah, learned a lot, met some great people. Um, you know, part of the reason I like signing up for these types of things uh, is to force myself outside of my comfort zone and to force me to do things that I don't normally do on my own. Um, so that was really cool. And, and lastly, it just, it reminded me of how much respect and reverence I have uh, for those that have, have served in the military um, and uh, learn perspectives through their vantage point. You know, most of the things that I teach in my, my programs uh, are through the lens of someone that spent his whole life in athletics and through basketball and through sport. So it was kind of neat to learn very similar lessons and principles from someone who spent his entire life as a Navy SEAL. That's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much for elaborating on that. And it's actually a common theme in your book too, the being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, and I love that. So you're, you're really practicing what you're preaching. I like that. And I guess it's really a worthwhile experience, uh, something like that. Oh, most certainly. So to get to your book, your newest release is Sustain Your Game. And it's the the um, second book after the first one race your game so you focus more on how pe how people high how high performers can stay at their level and um the the book is divided into three parts 
kind of the managing the the past, the present, and the future, which I very much like. So maybe can you give us a little glimpse into what these three um, timeframes are about and how we can handle them? Yeah, most certainly. Well, I'm going to take one step back just to put things into a little bit more context. So uh, for me, I'm always writing the book that I need to be reading myself. You know, I, I find it very therapeutic and incredibly helpful in my own life to research and write about the things that, that I struggle with and that I'm challenged with. And uh, when I left the basketball training space back in 2017 uh, and decided to become a corporate keynote speaker, um, within the first couple of years, I made the commitment to writing my first book, Raise Your Game, because I wanted to figure out what were the principles that I needed to apply to my life to, to climb that proverbial mountain uh, and reach the, the top of the keynote speaking game. And uh, certainly not to imply that I've reached that, I'll always be on that climb. Um, but then I started to realize while writing that book that there are different qualities needed to sustain excellence as there are to actually achieve it. So, you know, part of our journey in life is, is climbing that proverbial mountain to reach optimal performance. And then the next part is actually learning how to stay there and sustain excellence while at the same time, you know, enjoying that ride and, and remaining fulfilled as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was the impetus for writing Sustain Your Game. Uh, and it, came, it became very clear to me uh, that there were three traits that would easily undermine our ability to sustain high performance, sustain excellence, and sustain fulfillment. Uh, and that is stress, stagnation, and burnout. Uh, and those do align with the three timelines that you just mentioned so insightfully. You know, we, we, we face our stress kind of in the day to day. Uh, we face our, our stagnation kind of in that midterm, you know, a couple of months to a couple of years. And then an accumulation of both stress and stagnation is what will eventually lead to burnout, which is often something that happens to us in the long term. So I decided to divide the book up into those three sections um, and, and figuring out ways uh, that, that we can overcome that and, you know, to, to be able to work through and manage our stress, stagnation and burnout. And once again, the reason was those, were, <coughs> excuse me, those were three areas that I was being challenged by and three areas that I was struggling with. And I'm, I'm happy to elaborate on each one of those if, if that would work best for you. Yeah, cool. Thanks for, first of all, giving a quick glimpse into them. And we can surely dive into each of them a little more detailed. You just mentioned right now that you went through a kind of a transition yourself or transformation, maybe from one career to another, which is in a similar realm, but it's it's still a different skill set you, you had to um, learn and, and establish. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how you went through that transformation and why it's important, because it's also something that you talk about in the book, why it's important to reinvent ourselves every now and then. Absolutely. Well, to go back even further, so to give more context to your listeners and viewers, uh, basketball was my first identifiable passion. And I fell in love with the game of basketball at five years old. And I'm so thankful that here 40 years later, basketball is still a major pillar of my life. And I'm incredibly grateful that I've been able to not only earn a living, but, but build an extraordinary life uh, around the game that I've been most passionate about for my entire life. And uh, I spent the first portion uh, of my life as a basketball player. Um, when I was in college and I played at the university level here in the States, uh, I started to develop an equal love for strength and conditioning and improving athleticism and, 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 and performance training and mindset and nutrition. So when I graduated from college, I figured what could be better than combining my first love of basketball with my newfound love of strength and conditioning and performance training. So I became a basketball performance coach and spent 15 years uh, working with some of the highest performing players in the world. Um, I, I started by working with players at the high school level. Uh, many of them ended up matriculating up and playing in the NBA. Uh, I had a chance to work with Kevin Durant and Victor Oladipo back when they were in high school. Uh, and then that led to work with Nike and Jordan Brand and USA Basketball. And I had an opportunity uh, to work with guys like LeBron and Kobe and Stephen Curry and, and, and Steve Nash uh, and got to learn from, from those seasoned veteran Hall of Fame caliber players. Uh, and then after doing that for 15 years, I started to approach burnout. I started to get burned out on being on the court and in the weight room with players. Um, so that was a signal to me that I needed to pivot and I needed to make a change. And, and as you said so perfectly, 
I needed to reinvent myself. So I decided to leave the basketball training space entirely and reinvent myself as a corporate keynote speaker. Um, but basically in doing so, I was simply sharing all of the lessons and mindsets and disciplines and routines that I learned through the game. And I now share, you know, folks in the business world, how they can apply those same principles. So I still very much consider myself a performance coach, but instead of coaching basketball players on the court and in the weight room, I now coach executives and entrepreneurs and sales professionals in the business world uh, on how to utilize those, those same principles. So um, that was one of the reasons I, I needed to and felt comfortable writing Sustain Your Game was because I had experienced burnout myself and experienced, uh, you know, needing to make that, that type of pivot. So, um, you know, I, I always want to make sure that whatever I'm writing in my books is mirroring what it is that I'm going through in my own life. So I'm not just talking in theory, uh, I'm talking about what it is that I've experienced. So it was actually very therapeutic uh, to write Sustain Your Game because it certainly helped me as well. I find it really fascinating how what you've learned during your time as a basketball performance coach really is applicable to all other parts of life as well, which, which you show in your book now and, and the fact that you are now speaking and coaching people in the business world and i love that so as you quickly uh, briefly mentioned you had the chance to work with um, some really outstanding players in the past and i'm curious to hear maybe what do you think is the, the number one thing or what makes these people so great what makes them stand out among other professional athletes um, kind of making it uncommon amongst the uncommon There's, there's three characteristics that jump out immediately. I mean, I think there's probably at least a dozen if we were going to really unpack them. But there's three that, that um, I learned directly through these elite level performers and that I use in my own life and apply to every area of my life, both personally and professionally. Uh, the first, which really makes up the foundation of my entire philosophy and perspective, uh, is the lesson I learned directly from Kobe Bryant back in 2007 uh, when he told me that the best never get bored with the basics. Uh, and in essence, if you want to be good at anything, whether it's basketball or business or podcasting or anything in between, uh, you have to fall in love with the fundamentals and you have to work towards mastery of the fundamentals during the unseen hours. Uh, you know, in the game of basketball, it's, it's pretty obvious, you know, your fundamentals include your footwork, uh, your shooting mechanics. Um, so uh, if, if outside of the game of basketball, whether it's being an extraordinary podcast host or being an author or running a Fortune 500 business, you have to ask yourself, what are the basic building blocks? What are the fundamentals that I need to master in order to, to really excel in this specific area? And then once you've got clarity on what those fundamentals are, then you need to make the commitment to work towards mastery of them every single day you know, work towards mastery of them during what we call the unseen hours, uh, which are the hours when no one else is watching. So, so that's number one. High performers have a very strong respect and appreciation for the fundamentals and the basics. Number two is uh, it's important to be confident and you earn your confidence through demonstrated performance and through the, the conversations that you have with yourself, your self-talk uh, to prove that you're competent, but you need to blend your confidence with humility. Uh, the best players that I've ever been around, the Kobe's, the LeBron's, the KD's, uh, those guys are incredibly confident on the court, but they still remain humble enough to stay open to being coached. They still stay humble enough to be open to feedback. They still stay humble enough to know that no matter how good they are, they know they can still get better. They never feel like they've, they, they're a completed work that belongs under museum glass. They never feel like they're finished and they never feel like they're done. No matter how good they get, they believe they can always get better. And it's that humility that blends with confidence uh, that that's what makes them so special. And then the third component that is incredibly valuable that any of us can apply to our own lives is they're crystal clear on their North Star. Like they have very specific goals and things that they're trying to achieve. But once they've set those things, They just use them to provide some direction and some clarity. They then take their focus off of their goal and they put it on the process. They focus on the daily behaviors, on the micro skills, on the habits that are needed on a daily basis to inch themselves closer to reaching that goal. So high performers certainly dream very big, but they don't spend very much time dreaming 
and wishing and wanting and hoping, once they've set that goal, they roll up their sleeves and they get to work. And they ask themselves, what can I do today that will take me a little bit closer to that goal? You know, what are the habits I need to have now that will help me actualize and, and actually achieve that goal? And when you can focus on the fundamentals, when you can add humility to your earned confidence, and when you can put your effort and focus into the process, that there's really nothing that you, you can't achieve or accomplish. Well, I think the first point you mentioned, focusing on the basics and mastering them, that's probably the one that's most often overlooked by most people. But it, it reminds me of this quote by Bruce Lee, which, in which he says something like, I, ra I fear more the man who practices one kick a thousand times rather than a thousand kicks one time. So uh, that's really fascinating because you, you might think that the best of the best, they don't have to focus on, on the simple stuff, the basics anymore. And, and many people who are at the early stages, they might want to focus on the flashy stuff and then do drills and exercises and techniques that are way ad more advanced than their level might be. So I think that's a huge, a huge learning. Well said. You know, a couple other things come to mind. Um, first is, and I will f fully acknowledge that many times the basics, they can be monotonous. They can be mundane. They, they can almost get to the point of being boring. I, I recognize that. And I think that's one of the reasons why people often skip over them. You know, they, they're looking for something sexy and flashy and new. Um, But, but if you can learn to, to have that commitment to the basics, even if they get mundane and monotonous, if you can learn to love just the, the fact that you're improving, if you can learn to love the progress, you don't have to focus on the actual basics themselves. You focus on what those basics are allowing you to do. Um, that's that's a, a great step in the right direction. Um, and, and in addition to that, keep in mind that it doesn't mean that they only do the basics. It just means that they never leave them. So I'm not saying that Kobe Bryant, you know, used to do footwork drills for four hours every day. He might only spend 40 minutes a day doing the basics and then start to level up to more advanced techniques, more advanced drills, more advanced skills. But he never leaves the basics there. They are the foundation to which everything else is built. So if it, that's the beautiful part about this concept of kind of compounding interest. You know, if you work on the basics every single day, even just for a little bit, that will accumulate and add up. So it's, it's this concept of doing a little, a lot that will, will end up adding up. So I think from a basic standpoint, you know, if you love improvement, uh, if you love progress, you love evolution, um, then you'll learn to stick with them. And, and I know in my own life, because I've tried to adopt that in everything I do, Anytime I'm not getting the type of results I believe I should be getting, or I'm not performing at the level that I believe I'm capable of performing, I usually am, have started to, to leave the basics and I have to, to refocus my lens and get back to them. So the ultimate goal is to never leave them at all. But because we're all human and we're flawed and we're fallible, it's going to happen occasionally. But as soon as I dial back in and I refocus the lens on committing to the basics, I usually see my performance and my results and achievement escalate immediately. Very interesting. So you said that that's one of the things that sets apart the, the great performers, the great athletes. Now, I'm a basketball player myself, but obviously not a professional. I play in an amateur um, league. So I'm curious for people like me or for a team like mine do the same thing supply or would you say that different things are more important for amateur athletes no it, it not only does it apply whether you're an amateur or a pro it applies whether you're a basketball player or a piano player or a podcast host or an entrepreneur or even if you're just a mother or father that wants to be a better parent to your child These principles have such high utility uh, and they apply across the board. That's what I think I love most about my work um, is the similarities be between and the utility between what these elite level players did in all of these other other areas of our life. You know, if if someone out there, if your goal is is also to write a book, well, figure out what are the basic building blocks that you need to become a, a good writer and stick to those. You know, what is the process that you need to follow Uh, to see your book through to the finish and follow those. Um, same thing, you know, in relationships. Uh, if you're looking to have a better marriage, 
ask yourself, what are the fundamentals of having an intimate relationship, uh, of creating a deep connection with another human being, and then stick to those basics? So yeah, uh, that's what I love about this work is it applies everywhere. And that's been really helpful for me as a father. I have three young children and and at present, all three of them play basketball and they, they enjoy basketball. But I like knowing that the seeds I'm planting with them far exceed the game of basketball. That if one, if they ever choose to stop playing and do something else, the lessons will still apply. Or, and this is probably more realistic, uh, whenever their basketball career comes to an end, whether that's at the end of high school, the end of college, who knows? Even if they're fortunate enough to play professionally, you know, most people have retired by the time they're 30, 32 years old from professional sports. They still have another 60 to 70 years on the planet where they can apply these lessons. So I'm very thankful that that these things carry over and cross over into every area of our life. Yeah, and you mentioned that in the book a couple of times too. As I said, you have a lot of examples too, which which highlights your point of it's it's applicable to everything. So I love that. Now, I'm a huge fan of Kobe Bryant actually myself. He's one of my biggest inspirations and it's exciting that you've worked with him personally and, and I've I've heard you tell one story which you maybe could cover quickly of of you. I think you met him for the first time back then when you um, joined him uh, on a workout. So maybe can you tell the listeners how that was and, and what blew your mind about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. What I'll do is I'll give you kind of the really condensed version of it, but then I'll actually piggyback on top of that a second lesson that I learned, and then we can direct folks to my YouTube channel where they could actually see a full video of the entire story, uh, sets of some highlights, because I think that'll that'll do it more justice than me trying to say it here. Um, but back in 2007, uh, I had a chance to work the first ever Kobe Bryant Skills Academy, and Nike brought in uh, the best high school and college players from around the country for an intense camp with Kobe, who at the time was without question the best player in the world. And uh, you know, having been around basketball my whole life, you know, I was dying to see one of his workouts, and he let me come watch. Uh, and it was really, really early one morning, um, so really it was just Kobe and his trainer and and, and myself were in the gym. Uh, and, and I watched him do these basic fundamentals over and over for the first portion of the workout. And, and that's ultimately what led me to ask him later that day at camp. Uh, you know, I, I said, Kobe, I don't, I don't get it. You're the best player in the world. Why are you doing such basic drills? And, and that is when he looked me in the eye and said what I referenced earlier. He said, I'm the best player in the world because the best never get bored with the basics. And, and I remember going to watch that workout early that morning, thinking I was going to see a bunch of sizzle and a bunch of flash and a bunch of really intricate, you know, uh, intense and in, insane drills. And instead I saw somebody completely dedicated and focused to the fundamentals and mastering the basics. So that was a good lesson for me because I left thinking, you know, if the best player in the world can focus on the fundamentals, then I certainly can as well. And, and that did change for me, uh, you know, my perspective. Um, I came, the, later I ended up finding out in a separate conversation that the reason he wanted to work out so early in the morning, and, and for context, I mean, he was in the gym at 3.30 a.m. Um, I, I later found out, you know, he said, even the most ambitious and dedicated and driven NBA players are gonna work out twice a day during the off season. You know, they're, they're gonna work out for a couple hours in the morning and a couple hours in the afternoon or early evening. And he said, if I only do what they're doing, then I'll only progress at the rate that they progress. In order for me to have an advantage and separate myself from them, I need to put in more work than they do. So I need to get in an extra workout. So I'm gonna come in at 3.30 in the morning. So that way when I'm coming home from my first workout, they're going to the gym for their first workout. When they're coming home from their first workout, I'm going to the gym for my second workout. So in essence, he was always one step ahead. And uh, he said, you know, um, in a couple of weeks, you know, over a matter of weeks, that really won't make much difference. But when you start to stack weeks into months and months into years and years into decades, doing a little bit more every single day will add up and, and I'll separate myself from everybody else in the league and they'll never be able to catch me. And that was his mindset. And, you know, I think that's pretty congruent uh, with the Mamba mentality that he was so famous for. Uh, and I thought that was a really interesting approach. Now, uh, I do want to make one disclaimer that as much as I respect and revere and, and, and I'm inspired by Kobe, um, I don't always believe that more is better. 
that, that I don't want someone's takeaway from that story to be, you know, uh, my competition works 12 hours a day, so I'm going to work 16 hours a day. You know, my competition works six days a week, so I'm going to work seven. My competition, you know, takes two weeks vacation every year. I'm not going to take any vacation. I'm not implying that more is better. Uh, I think better is better, and we should be looking at quality over quantity. However, I think it's important to note that that was just Kobe's mindset, that he wanted to be very intentional about creating separation, and he never wanted anyone to have an advantage over him. So I just wanted to throw that disclaimer out because every single person listening or watching to this, you need to figure out how you make your preparation, your separation, and what you need to do to give yourself an advantage. That's a good point because I actually wanted to get right into that. You, you talked about preparation. That's part one part of how to manage stress, the first level of sustaining your game. So maybe uh, can you explain what does good preparation look like in order to avoid or manage stress in a high performance situation? Certainly. Well, uh, I want to clarify when, when we're talking about stress, and this is this is one of the most epiphanal moments that I've had, um, very similar to the moment I had with Kobe Bryant, uh, was a moment I had when I was researching for this book. Uh, and there's a gentleman named Eckhart Tolle, uh, who for lack of a better term is kind of a modern day philosopher. Um, and when he, I heard him for the first time say what he defined stress as, it, it changed everything for me. He said, stress is our desire for things to be different than they are in the present moment. And when he said that, it just hit me like a ton of bricks because I realized that stress is not caused by what's going on in the world. Our stress is caused by ourselves. It's self-imposed with us wanting things to be different. In other words, our stress is caused by resisting reality. By wishing things were different than they currently were is where we get our stress from. So when I realized that, that circumstances and events and what people say and what people do is not the cause of my stress, but rather my resistance to those things is what causes my stress. I mean, it was, it was life-changing for me. It was like this, this weight vest was lifted off of my shoulders and I could take a big, deep breath because then I realized I'm back in control. Now, I clearly don't control what's going on in the world. I don't control events. I don't control circumstances. I don't control what people say or do, but I absolutely control uh, my response to those things. And my response is what dictates my stress. So I no longer worry about what's going on around me. I put all of my focus on having intentional, thoughtful responses. And in doing so, I've been able to drastically lower, lower my stress. And see, when you, when you believe your stress is caused by outside forces and external forces, then by default, you are a victim to circumstance. You are a victim to what's going on around you. And, and, and I don't want to live my life that way. I did that for over 40 years, uh, and it did not lead to the happiness or fulfillment or performance that I, I believed I was capable of having. And once I was able to switch that, you know, flip that switch and look at things differently and say, yeah, things are going to happen, and I get to choose how to respond to them. Now, one important component to that is I'm not saying that the things that go on in the world are to my liking, and I'm not saying that everything that happens is my preference. I'm saying that I acknowledge that it's not the world's job to line up perfectly for me, that it's not the universe's job to conspire to do everything the way that I want it. Some things happen every day that I like, some things happen every day that I don't, but I choose my response in either situation, and to me, that is the most empowering mindset one can have. Absolutely. I totally love that takeaway you shared from, from Eckhart Tolle. He is definitely a very wise man and his books are, are truly great too. Yeah. So kind of getting from the preparation to the actual moment, what is the best way or what can people do to handle the stress of the moment when they have to perform? So let's say I'm a basketball player, I get to shoot uh, free throws and I walk to the line and I'm in the moment And, and I have this, these butterflies in my belly or this nervousness. How do I handle that the best way possible? Well, we actually said it so beautifully right there. The key is really being dialed into the present moment. See, the, the mistake that we all make, and trust me, I'm still guilty of this. I mean, none of this stuff have I mastered yet. This is all stuff that I am a constant work in progress. Now, I will say I'm proud of the progress I've made, uh, and I love the path that I'm on. Um, 
but I haven't mastered any of this yet. I, I'm still very much working on it. Um, but the key is being in the present moment. See, it's very easy to get distracted or depressed by the past, by things that have happened before, and making the assumption that what happened before is going to happen right now. So in that case, in, in that example you gave, it'd be very easy to say, oh man, you know, I missed my last two free throws. I'm probably going to miss this one also, or at least have that thought run through your mind. So it, it's very easy to get distracted by the past. And, and we have to keep in mind, we can't live in the past. There's nothing we can do about the past, at least the events and the circumstances. Now, we can change our relationship to what's happened in the past. You, you could look back on something that you used to think was bad for you or was a trauma or, or, and you can change your relationship with that and say, no, that didn't happen to me. That actually happened for me. You know, I'm actually thankful that that happened now because it caused me to do this or to do this and it put me on this path. So one of the mistakes that we as human beings make is we get caught up in the past, uh, which distracts us and, and many times depresses us. The other mistake that we can make, especially when about to shoot a free throw, is we get anxious about the future. We start worrying about a future that hasn't even happened yet. We, we kind of try to predict the future and we, we superimpose something negative happening. So we start thinking, well, what happens if I miss? Oh my gosh, what, what are my teammates going to say? What are my coaches going to say? What are the fans going to say? What are people on Twitter going to say if I miss this shot? And now we're, we're putting all of our thought into what we don't want to happen, um, which is pretty futile and, and not a great exercise of, of, of energy or, or mental capacity uh, management. Instead, we want to try to hypothesize what we want to happen, you know, um, because the future is 100% hypothetical. None of us can predict the future. You know, when you're stepping up to the free throw line, you can't predict with 100% accuracy whether you're going to make it or miss it. You know, it's simply unknown. Now, if you've practiced your free throws and you use good form and you have some mental toughness, you know, you can increase the chance that you're going to make that shot, but you certainly can't guarantee it. So if the future is 100% hypothetical, why not just assume that things are going to work out in your favor? Like if you're just going to make up a story in your head, why tell yourself I'm probably going to miss instead of telling yourself I'm probably going to make it? Both of them are completely made up. Both of them are hypothetical, so why not err on the side of assuming that it's going to go well? So I found, and this again is incredibly challenging, when I can stop being distracted by the past and I can stop being anxious about the future and I can just take a deep breath and just be mentally, physically, and emotionally present in that moment, because remember, in order to win the moment, you have to be in the moment, and then simply let, in this case, my muscle memory take over and just shoot the free throw, which I've done, you know, thousands and thousands of times in practice. That gives me the best chance to be successful. And, and with that, still having the caveat of knowing that if for any reason it doesn't go in my favor, if I don't make the shot, that I'll be strong enough to deal with it at that time. You know, that, that, that life is not going to come to an end because I missed a free throw. That if it doesn't work out in my favor, I'm strong enough to persevere and I have the type of grit to move me forward. Yeah, that's powerful. And the the thing is also with free free throws, it might not be like that, but with other shots in the game of basketball, and it also applies certainly to other sports as well. I mean, you have to take the free throws, but if you're in the game and you get the ball, you don't have to take the three-point shot, for example. So if you've missed a couple already, you might feel like, well, I don't want to take this one because, as you said, you think of the past, you might have missed a couple shots before, and then you end up not taking the shots. And you talk about that too, how people, elite shooters like Steph Curry, handle that. So maybe share share that lesson with us too. Most certainly. Yeah, that, you know... There's several things that make Steph Curry the best shooter to ever play the game. Uh, he has great hand-eye coordination and depth perception and athleticism. He's incredibly mentally strong and has earned the right to be confident. He has great footwork and balance and perfect shooting mechanics. I mean, all of those things contribute to him being a great shooter. But I think one of the traits that doesn't get highlighted enough is the fact that he has what's called a whiteboard memory. You know, if you were to write a bunch of stuff up on the whiteboard and then you can just erase it in one swoop, that's kind of how he views shooting. Stephen Curry doesn't care if he's missed his last seven shots or not. He is going to shoot that eighth shot with the confidence as if he had made the last seven shots. He does not let 
previous missed shots impact the present shot. And that is really hard to do. I mean, it's it's hard not to, to look back and think, I can't believe I've missed my last seven shots. Oh my gosh, what if I miss this one? Uh, I mean, that's normal and that's natural. I'm not judging anyone that, that does that, um, but for his ability to block that out and just kind of move to the next play or the next shot uh, is crucial. And, you know, one of the examples I use in the book, which which I always love is, you know, if, if I were to take a, a coin and I were to flip it and I were to get heads seven times in a row, what percentage chance will I get heads on the eighth flip? And and many times people just, they automatically think, well, man, if you got heads seven times in a row, you have to get tails on this next one, you're due. Um, and I understand the thinking behind that, but it's not correct. Every single time you flip a coin, it's the exact same percentages, it's 50-50. It doesn't matter if you get 100 heads in a row, it doesn't change the odds of the next flip because the coin has no idea. The coin has no idea what landed on it, you know, the previous times. And it's the same thing with us. So maybe your last seven sales calls, you've got the big fat no. Somebody is not interested or they hang up the phone. Um, that doesn't have any impact on your next sales call unless you allow it to. Now, if you say, oh, th these last seven people told me no, three people hung up on me. I guess I'm not good enough. I guess my product's not that good. I'm pretty sure this next person's going to say no also. Well, you're going to drag that energy into that next call. And yeah, you probably will get another no. But if you can be you know, grit, gritty enough and resilient enough to say, yeah, these last seven did not go in my direction. That's okay. This is a new person. This new person has no idea what happened on my previous seven calls. So I'm going to go into it with the optimism and the enthusiasm and the preparation to deliver the best that I'm capable of. So uh, very easily said, not very easily executed. And I think it's like that with most of the tools you share. Most of them seem to be simple, but actually doing that in the moment, keeping control of your thoughts and changing that, that narrative to it's just another shot. I have the same chances of hitting like the, the prior shots. I think that's what, what I, was actually hard. Oh, so hard. There's so many things in life that are easy and premise Uh, but difficult to do in, in execution, you know, and, and that's why one of the other lessons that I learned from Kobe was just because something is basic, it doesn't mean that it's easy. I mean, everything I just explained in the last three minutes is a very basic principle. I mean, my children would understand that. I don't think I'm confusing any one of your listeners. Very basic, but not easy to do. You know, if I had seven sales calls in a row where I heard no, it would be really hard for me not to drag that into the next call. But that's ultimately the goal. And, and the first step to any of this is simply awareness. Uh, and that's because we'll never improve something we're oblivious to and we'll never fix something we're unaware of. So we have to be aware of when our mind is starting to drift either into the past or into the future. Uh, we have to be aware of uh, when we start to get distracted by the past or anxious about the future because that's what will allow us to recenter and put all of our faculties into the present moment. One thing that really blew my mind in your book was when you shared the power of visualization, how it can actually help prepare for a situation, but also become better at something without actually doing it, actively doing it. And in fact, how you explained it has helped me to better grasp the concept of visualization because sometimes in the past, I mean, I heard about it, visualize your goals and everything, your dreams and, and like the process too but I kind of had a hard time like what does it actually look like and, and in your book you give a couple examples that made it really simple again and also very easy to understand what you mean by that so in what way have you with your athletes that you coached or, or even they themselves have used visualization to to prepare Uh, for their games, for their performances. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you went in that direction. And, and it, actually, we can stay on par with the example of an athlete shooting a free throw because the one that blew my mind the most was the research study that, that had three different groups. Uh, you know, one of the groups uh, practiced free throws every single day. Uh, one of the groups just visualized Uh, making free throws every day. And then one of the groups didn't do anything. Um, and it was amazing that the group that shot and practiced free throws physically every day only had a very small percentage improvement more than the group 
that just visualized every single day. You know, that's how powerful our minds are uh, because our minds actually draw into the emotions and the, the feelings that we get when we actually perform an activity. Um, so, I mean, to really get good at something, you need to actually put in the reps and actually practice the physical skill, but then combine that with, with the mental skill of visualization. Um, back when I was working in the direct training space, you know, the teams I'd work with before the game, you know, we'd sit quietly in the locker room and, and I'd have them close their eyes and I'd have each and every one of them visualize a time in their playing career where, where they were just on fire, you know, where every single shot they took was money, where they had that ball on a string, like visualize when you played the best game you've ever played. And I, I wanted them to, to really have a visceral experience and, you know, think of, you know, what did the gym sound like? What did the gym smell like? What did it look like? How did you feel every time the ball, you know, left your hands and, and you saw it swish through the net? You know, I wanted to put them in the type of frame of mind that gave them all of the emotional feelings of when they were absolutely crushing it one time in a game so that when they took the court that night, you know, they were riding out there on a high and they were, they were remembering, you know, what that felt like. Um, I use visualization uh, a lot in my own life. Uh, professionally speaking, uh, every time I'm, I'm tasked with giving a corporate keynote talk uh, or, or uh, a workshop, I always arrive at the venue the day before that I'm going to speak so that I can see the room and see the way the room is set up, to see what the lighting is going to look like, to see what the stage is going to look and feel like, uh, to see where the audience will be seated. You know, And I go and I rehearse it, and in my mind when I'm rehearsing, I'm imagining that there's people there. Uh, I'm going through my steps as if I was actually doing it live. And doing that the day before uh, helps me both consciously and unconsciously, especially that night when I sleep, to feel even better prepared for the next day. So when I'm taking the stage to give the real keynote, I don't feel like it's the first time that I'm, I'm on that stage and I'm speaking to this group because I've already rehearsed this in my mind several times. So uh, yeah, visualization can be a really, really powerful tool uh, in really any area of your life. The story and the study about the free throws just blew my mind. I think that's incredible that you can become better at something simply by visualizing it. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, so for sure. One, one last thing, last thing that I want to get into is you, you talk about creating change and the importance of habits in your book. So maybe share uh, some insights about that. How can we create change? Most people have some type of goal or a desired outcome or a North Star. Uh, and, and once you have that, you know, these are your dreams. You need to make sure that your habits, the things you do unconsciously and the things you do consistently are in alignment with that goal. Um, and if they're not, then one of those two things needs to change. You either need to improve your habits or you need to lower your goal. And I, I say that with a huge smile because, you know, hardly anybody wants to lower their goal, uh, which means the only part of the equation you have to fix now are your habits. You know, I would say to a player that was in high school who had the goal of playing in college, you know, on a day that they weren't working very hard or they weren't working very smart or they weren't being a good teammate, you know, I would just say, hey, is, is that the type of work ethic of a college basketball player? Uh, and, and I didn't need to yell at them. I didn't need to curse at them. I didn't need to demean them. I would literally just say, is, is that the type of effort that a college basketball player would give? And, and that's usually what would kind of jock them back into thinking, no, a college player would probably work much harder than that. So I need to work harder than that. You know, you, you need to, to try and emulate the traits and behaviors of, of where you're trying to go before you get there. You know, there's another old adage that says champions behave like champions before they become champions. It, it's kind of, you know, if you act as if you're a champion, then that will give you the type of result of being a champion. So uh, for me, the habits uh, are crucial and nobody has 100% perfect habits. But if most of the habits you have are in alignment with putting you on the path of where you're trying to go, now it's just a matter of, of doing that consistently over time uh, and you give yourself the best chance you can to be successful. Interesting, yeah. I love that. So since this podcast is called The Power of Books and we're talking about you, your book here, I got to ask the question, what were one to two or maybe three books that have impacted your life the most? What are, what are the, the best books you would absolutely recommend checking out? 
Well, one of them is an oldie but a goodie, and, and it was written by Coach K, uh, the former head basketball coach of, of Duke University's men's basketball program. Uh, and he's written several books, but the one that most profoundly impacted me uh, was a book called Leading with the Heart. Uh, and it's all about uh, effective leadership. And that book really changed, you know, in a profound way, the way I viewed leadership. Um, another uh, more recent book, but equally powerful, uh, is a book called Atomic Habits uh, by my friend James Clear. Uh, most of what I, I teach and speak on and believe from a habit standpoint uh, are things that I've, I've learned from James and principles I've learned from James. So uh, those are two books immediately that, that I, I think are must-reads for anybody looking to, to level up. I totally second you on the Atomic Habits. I also love that one and recommend it to everybody, but I haven't read the one you mentioned by Coach K, so I might look into that one too. Awesome. So if people want to follow you and check out more of your stuff and, and connect with you, what's the best place where they can do that? Well, my main speaking website is allensteinjr.com. Uh, I have a supplemental site, strongerteam.com. I have information on my books. Uh, I have a podcast. I have an online course, and I do some exclusive one-on-one -on -one coaching, and you can find that at strongerteam.com. Uh, I'm very easily found at Alan Stein Jr. Uh, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, and I take a lot of pride in not only being very accessible, but also being very responsive. So uh, if anyone listening or watching this, uh, if something struck a chord, if you have a question you want to ask, if you want to share something, uh, just shoot me a direct message on Instagram or LinkedIn. Uh, I'm very good about getting back to folks. Uh, and then, of course, either of my books, Raise Your Game or Sustain Your Game, Uh, you can find on Amazon or Audible or wherever you like to get books and audio books uh, and always appreciate, you know, folks making the investment in, in something I've written. Cool. Yeah. And I totally can highlight that you responded so quickly to me reaching out to you and also on Instagram when I, when I reached out to you and messaged you. So, so that's totally right. And for those of you who are watching, I'm going to show the new book, Sustain Your Game, once more. Um, Go grab it. I really loved it. It was one of the most value dense books I've read in a while, to be honest. And I think it, it simply, it's a collection of some of the most important learnings that you can actually find about high performance. And it's all very applicable as, as we cover today. It applies to all areas of life, not just basketball, which is probably what most people are not interested in, but uh, other parts of their life. So uh, I can highly recommend checking out the book. And Alan, thank you so much for the interview. I really appreciate you taking the time and I loved our conversation today. I did as well. This was so much fun. Thank you. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of The Power of Books. As always, you will find all the relevant links for today's episode in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to subscribe so that you will get notified whenever a new episode drops. And you would do us a huge favor if you could give us a five-star review on your favorite platform. I hope to see you next week and until then, keep reading, keep learning and keep growing. Bye-bye.